Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL 3D game tutorial and this week we're going to be implementing the first half of simple shadow mapping. So the structure of the tutorial this week is going to be a little bit different from usual and this is because shadow mapping is a pretty big topic and probably the most complicated one that we've covered so far. I think if we did it the usual way it would be about three or four tutorials of just typing out code which I think would be a little bit tedious for all of us and it would probably have got a bit difficult to keep track of which bit of code was doing what. So for this week only I'm going to structure the tutorial slightly differently, so I'm going to start in the usual way by explaining the basic concepts behind shadow mapping, but I'm then going to provide you with most of the shadow mapping code, and then take you through the concepts in more detail, explaining the code as I go, and then finally I'll show you how to use the shadow mapping code in your engine. So first up, what is a shadow? A shadow is obviously the lack of light on a surface which is caused because an object is blocking the light from reaching that surface. If you were able to look at a scene directly from the position of the light source, then everything you could see would be in light, because if you can see it, then the light can see it as well, meaning that there's nothing blocking it from the light. Any areas that you can't see would be in shadow, because if you can't see them, then the light can't reach them. To implement shadow mapping we're going to be using this concept of what the light can see and what it can't see to determine what should be in the light and what should be in shadow. To do this we're first going to render the scene from the light's viewpoint, so as if the camera were in the light's position. We're then going to be rendering the scene from the light's perspective to a frame buffer object and if you haven't done the water tutorial series then I suggest that you stop watching this tutorial now and go and watch the first 9 minutes of the second water tutorial which will explain all about frame buffer objects, what they are and how we can use them. When we render the scene from the light's perspective to the FBO, we're actually going to be only rendering the depth buffer because we only care about the positions of the objects and how far away from the light they are. This gives us the shadow map which shows us everything that the light can see in the scene and also because it's a depth buffer it gives us information of how far from the light each object is. We can now use this information to determine which parts of the scene should be lit up and which parts should be in the shade. So we then render our scene as normal but we now do a little extra check in the fragment shader to check whether each pixel can be seen by the light or not. To check if a pixel can be seen by the light we first need to find out where that pixel would be on the shadow map and we can do that with some matrix transformations. Once we've found the pixel's position on the shadow map, we can use the depth information to find out if there is any object in front of that pixel which would be blocking it from the light. You can see that for this pixel on the tree here, there is nothing in front of it in the shadow map and therefore the light can see it, meaning it must be in the light. The pixel therefore just uses the usual lighting calculations. For another example, let's say that this pixel on the terrain here is currently being rendered. We first transform it to find out where on the shadow map it would be, and we find that it is hidden from the light's view by this tree. Because the light can't see that terrain pixel, it can't be lit up, and therefore we'll darken the output colour of that pixel to make it look like it's in the shade. So that's the basic concept behind shadow mapping. We first render the scene from the light's perspective to create the shadow map, and that tells us what the light can see and what it can't see and we then render the scene as normal, checking the shadow map to see which pixels can't be seen by the light and therefore shouldn't be lit up. So you can now download the shadows package from the description of this video which contains my implementation of these concepts. Then just go ahead and add the shadows package to your source folder and refresh the project in Eclipse so that you can see the code. At this stage you'll probably have a couple of little errors in the code, so let's just fix those quickly and hopefully you should just need to set these three variables here in the master renderer to public and that should fix all of those errors. There is actually one other small error that we have to fix and that is with the projection matrix code. I actually made a very slight mistake in tutorial 8 with this code so it's quite likely that your code will also contain this little error. The projection matrix creation code should actually look like this and to make sure that you're using the correct code for this you can just copy and paste this method from the description of this video. So I'm now going to go through all of the code in this package and explain what it's all doing, but before I start I need to mention a couple of things about the light that we're going to be using. We're only going to be using one light to create the shadows for now, and that light is the sun in the scene. In terms of all the shadow mapping stuff, this sun is going to be represented by a direction only, 
and not a position. It's going to be assumed that the sun is so far away that all the light at any point in the scene is arriving in exactly the same direction, so whenever I talk about the light in this tutorial, I'm just referring to the direction of the sunlight, which is the same at every single point in the scene. For this tutorial, the light has absolutely no position, it just has a direction. So before we start, just make sure that the light that you're using as your sun is actually far away enough to make sure that the light direction is the same at all points in the scene. If you're not sure how to do this, just multiply your light's position by 10,000 or something. So the whole shadows package is actually just for rendering the scene from the light's viewpoint to the shadow map. The checking whether each pixel in the scene can be seen by the light using the shadow map is something that we still have to implement into our current entity and terrain shaders. So let's have a quick look through the shadow map rendering process. We'll start off in the Shadow Frame Buffer class, which deals with all the code to do with the frame buffer to which we're going to be rendering the shadow map. Everything here is code that we've seen before in the water tutorials, so there's nothing really new that I need to explain here, but just note how we're only creating a depth buffer texture and only adding a depth attachment to the FBO, so we're not adding any color attachment at all. This is because we only need the depth buffer texture of the scene, which will be our shadow map, and we don't care about the color buffer at all. You'll also notice that the glDrawBuffer method, which determines which color attachment should be rendered to, has been set to none here, because again, there is no color attachment. Let's have a look in the shaders now, and you can see that this is literally the simplest shader program that we're ever going to use. All that happens in this shader program is that the vertex positions get transformed using a model matrix, view matrix, and projection matrix, which is something that we've always done when rendering 3D objects, but this time the matrices have been pre-multiplied together in the Java code and then passed to the vertex shader as a single uniform. And in the fragment shader, there is absolutely nothing going on. This is because we don't care about the lighting on these objects, we don't care about any textures, all we care about is the vertex positions, because that's the only data that gets rendered to the depth buffer to create that shadow map. Then we've got the shadow shader class, which is also as simple as possible, nothing new to explain here, and then we've got the shadow map entity renderer class, which is in charge of rendering all the entities to the shadow map. And again, this is a very simple class, nothing that we haven't done before, so to render the entities, we bind the VAO for each model, and notice here that we only enable attribute zero in the VAO, which is where the positions are stored, because we don't need the normals or the texture coordinates in the shaders. And then we render each entity that uses that model. To render each entity, we first create the model matrix in the usual way, and then multiply it with the projection view matrix, which is the projection matrix multiplied by the view matrix, and we then load up that projection view model matrix to the shaders. Finally, we just call glDrawElements to actually render the entity. So all the code that we've seen so far has pretty much just been a super simplified version of our usual 3D entity rendering process. The main thing that's different about rendering the scene to a shadow map is that we're rendering from the light's point of view, and so the main differences in the code are to do with the view matrix, and actually also the projection matrix as well. Not only are we going to need a different view matrix to render the scene from the light's perspective, but we're also going to be using a different type of projection matrix. Usually, we use perspective projection, which creates a view frustum which looks something like this, and everything inside this frustum is what gets rendered onto the screen. But while a camera sees the world like this, the sunlight sees the world like this, because the light doesn't have a position, and so the light rays are all parallel. Therefore, we're going to be using an orthographic projection matrix which creates a cuboidal view area, and everything inside this cuboid will get rendered to the shadow map. The exact shape of this cuboid is determined by the projection matrix, and then the position and orientation of this cuboid in the world is determined by the view matrix. This is exactly the same as when we use a view frustum, where the projection matrix determines the dimensions of the view frustum, and the view matrix determines how it's positioned in the world. The position and size of the cuboid are extremely important, because only objects inside the cuboid are going to get rendered to the shadow map, and therefore only objects inside this cuboid can cast shadows. You might think then that we should just make the cuboid as big as possible to cover the whole world, meaning that everything would always cast shadows. 
However, the shadow map is a texture and it only has a certain resolution, and the more of the scene that you choose to render, the smaller the objects are going to appear on the shadow map, and that will lead to very, very pixelated shadows. We want to keep this cuboid as small as we possibly can to keep the shadows as high resolution as possible, but obviously we also need to make sure that all of the objects near the camera are in the cuboid so that they actually cast shadows. In the code, the shadow box class is used to represent this cuboid, and it calculates the position and size of the cuboid every frame to make sure that it's as optimal as possible. The way that it does this is to calculate the position of the eight vertices of the camera's current view frustum, and it then creates a bounding box around them, with the bounding box lined up with the light's direction. This bounding box represents the view cuboid, and this information is used to create the projection and view matrices in another class. When the shadow box is created, it initially works out the widths and the heights of the near and far plane of the camera's view frustum. You can actually change the length of the view frustum here with the shadow distance value. Um, this will determine the range from the camera in which objects cast shadows. So if you make this smaller, then the shadow resolution will be improved, but the distance at which objects stop casting shadows will be shorter. Setting this to a high value will mean that more distant objects also cast shadows, but the resolutions of all the shadows in general will be a lot worse because a lot more of the scene is being rendered to the shadow map. In the update method, the size of the cuboid is calculated to every frame. First off, I've used some simple geometry calculations to calculate the positions of the eight vertices of the view frustum in world space. These then get transformed into light space so that they're all in relation to the light's x, y, and z axes. This then makes it extremely easy to find the maximum and minimum x, y, and z values in light space, which can easily be used to determine the dimensions of the cuboid. The center of the cuboid is also needed in order to position the cuboid in the right place in the world, and this is found by calculating the center of the cuboid in light space and then converting it back into world space. The final class in the shadows package is the shadow map master renderer, which is in charge of using all of the other classes to carry out the rendering of the scene to the shadow map. And this is actually the only class that we have to use elsewhere in our code to get this all to work. The constructor here is pretty simple, all it does is to create instances of all the other classes like the shader, the shadow box, the FBO, and the entity renderer. And down here there's also a simple cleanup method which is used to delete the shader and the FBO when the game closes. Other than that, there are just a few getter methods, so there's one to get the shadow map texture, one to get the lights view matrix, and this one here which I'll be talking about more next week. The most important method here is of course the rend method, which takes in the entities that are going to be rendered to the shadow map, and also the light whose perspective the scene will be rendered from. The first thing that it does is to update the shadow box which will calculate the new optimal position and dimensions of the view cuboid, and it then calculates the light's direction, which we're just going to assume is the negative version of the sun's position, which will be pretty much accurate for the whole scene if the light is far enough away. It then prepares for rendering before using the shadow map entity renderer to render the scene to the shadow map. So let's have a look at what's going on in the prepare method before the rendering takes place. Firstly, the orthographic projection matrix and the light view matrix are updated using the information from the shadow box and the direction of the light, and they're then multiplied together to update the projection view matrix. The FBO with the depth buffer attachment is then bound, so that anything that gets rendered gets rendered to that FBO, and the depth test is enabled, and the depth buffer is cleared of any data from last frame. There's no need to clear the color buffer here, because there is no color buffer attached to the FBO. Finally, the shader is started, the rendering then takes place, and after rendering the shader program is stopped, and the shadow map FBO is unbound. So the last methods that we need to look at are the method used to create the orthographic projection matrix, and the method which creates the light's view matrix. Let's start with the projection matrix method, and orthographic projection matrices are actually pretty simple to create, you just need to decide on the width, height, and length dimensions of the view cuboid, and we already have those values calculated in the shadow box class, so the code to set up the projection matrix is very simple. Creating the light's view matrix, however, is unfortunately not quite so simple. If you remember, the projection matrix determines the dimensions of the view cuboid, 
and the view matrix determines its position and orientation in the world. So we need to create a view matrix that lines up the cuboid with the light's direction, because the whole point of this is to render the scene from the light's point of view, and it needs to center the cuboid in the correct position in the world so that the correct part of the scene gets rendered to the shadow map. We already have the light's direction, and the world position for the center of the cuboid was calculated in the shadow box class, so this code here then creates a view matrix looking in the same direction as the light and positioned in the correct place in the scene. Now, I don't really want to get too much into the maths in this tutorial, so I might create a typed explanation of what's going on here with the maths and link it to you so that anyone who's interested can read about it, but basically it's just calculating the pitch and yaw based off the viewing direction, which is the light direction in this case, and it then creates the view matrix pretty much like usual. So you should now hopefully have a good understanding of how the shadow package code renders entities to the shadow map from the light's perspective using an orthographic projection matrix. And again, the only real differences between this and a normal rendering of 3D entities is that we're only using a depth buffer, the view matrix is the light view matrix rather than the camera's view matrix, and the projection matrix is an orthographic matrix and not perspective. What we're going to do now is to get into the code and use the shadow map master renderer to render the entities in our scene to a shadow map, and then this week we're just going to be displaying that shadow map onto the screen using a GUI. So let's now go into the master renderer and in here we're going to create an instance of the shadow map master renderer so that we can create the shadow map. In the master render constructor, um, well this needs to take in the camera object now because when we create an instance of the shadow map renderer we need to have access to the camera to put it into the constructor here. Let's now go down to the cleanup method and when the game closes we're going to need to clean up the shadow map master renderer. And I'm also going to create a method here which will return the ID of the shadow map texture so that in the main game loop we will be able to call this method and then use it to display the shadow map onto a GUI. I'm now just going to create the method which is going to be responsible for rendering all of the entities to the shadow map. So this will take in the list of entities that we want to render to the shadow map and it's going to take in the light which is acting as the sun. I'm then just going to iterate through that list of entities and for each entity I'm going to call the process entity method which will sort the entities into the hash map of entities and I can then call the shadow map renderer dot render method which takes in that hash map of entities and the sun and then we're going to clear that hash map so that it's all clear for the next time. So let's now go into the main game loop and we need to put the camera into the master renderer constructor and unfortunately the camera is down here which requires the player so I'm going to take the player and camera constructor um, initialization code up here put it before the master renderer code and then I can put the camera into the master renderer constructor. You might need to do a bit of um, rearranging of code to get that to work. And then in the while loop, just before any rendering takes place, I'm going to call the render shadow map method, which takes in the entities and the light that I'm using as the sun. I'm then going to go ahead and create a GUI on which I can display the shadow map. So this GUI texture um, it takes in the renderer dot get shadow map texture and then you just need to create a decent position and scale for it on the screen and once you've done that you need to add it to your list of GUI textures so that it gets rendered when you render your GUIs and go ahead and run that and hopefully you should now see something like this where you can see the shadow map displayed on a GUI um, it will be upside down but don't worry about that uh, but you should be able to see the outlines of the trees and the player in the center there and it should be rescaling and resizing the whole time as it calculates that view cuboid every single frame. So that is it for this week. Next time we're going to be doing the other half of this which is to test the shadow map in the shaders when we render the scene normally to find out which parts of the scene are hidden from the light. If you're feeling adventurous though, you could have a go at implementing this in the code for yourself and I'll put a couple of screenshots in the description to give you a few hints about how to do this. But yeah, thank you guys very much for watching this video. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a lovely week, and I will see you all next time.